Well, welcome tonight. I'm Bob Johnson. I just wanted to uh, say a couple things before we get on with tonight's program. A lot of times I'm asked, what is the, the MIT Enterprise Forum? And basically what I think the way we characterize it is that we're really promoting the entrepreneurial ecosystem. And I just have one little thing I want to brag about tonight. The Kauffman Foundation, which is one of the leading organizations that studies entrepreneur uh, activity and entrepreneurialism, has just released a, uh, a report. It's called uh, Entrepreneurial Impact, the Role of MIT. And this report has analyzed the economic impact of <clears throat> alumni, MIT alumni-founded companies <clears throat> and the uh, entrepreneurial eco ecosystem that MIT supports, which includes 24 chapters of the Enterprise Forum, like us, and also the Venture Mentoring Service, which is uh, currently focused in New England but is beginning to move west. Uh, in fact, I'd like to, in a moment, introduce a couple of folks from that who are here this evening. But the report basically shows that the active companies founded by MIT graduates, if they formed an, in, an independent nation, on a global basis, an estimate of the annual world revenue would be $2 trillion, and it would produce the equivalent of the 11th the largest uh, economy in the world. So we're very proud of that kind of impact, and it obviously means a lot for, uh, for our country um, in, in getting out of the mess that we're in. I would like briefly, uh, just quickly, to introduce uh, Sherwin Greenblatt, and Alec Dingy from Venture Mentoring Service. Um, basically, the idea is to help entrepreneurs do a more effective job of being a CEO earlier and uh, less trial, trial and error. Um, Sherwin is quite an interesting fellow. He was the, he's the retired president of Bose Corporation and has been very active recently at MIT, as, first as executive vice president of MIT, and then as acting director of the Alumni Association, which is our parent organization, and is now <clears throat> focused on the Venture Mentoring Service. Uh, also point out that Santa Barbara Channels is here recording, and we'll be televising this uh, program. <clears throat> you may remember when we did the new news in Santa Barbara last June, they did the recording of it and then broadcast it about 30 times that summer. And that program ended up winning an award, a uh, public forum award for Santa Barbara Channels for the western states of the U.S., so we're hoping it will be as good or better. Uh, I'd like to introduce Jacques Habra, who is our moderator for this evening and who put the program together. Jacques is a web entrepreneur. Who's, uh, he has been named in the past as the Arthur Anderson um, <clears throat> Entrepreneur of the Year and also Ernst & Young Entrepreneur of the Year, so he's uh, quite an effective young man. Um, and he's going to take over and, and basically uh, introduce our speakers and, and run the program for this evening. Thanks. Thank you, everybody. On behalf of uh, the entire uh, board of the MIT Central Coast Forum, I want to invite you all tonight to the web still funding. We're excited to have such an awesome turnout. I think it's a testament to the theme and to uh, all the time that we're spending these days online versus driving cars or spending money other places. Tonight we have a really esteemed panel uh, with us. We've got a couple of finance-backed folks that uh, we'll talk about in a minute, in a little while, uh, who are um, you know really experienced in this space. And we have three entrepreneurs who have done something and are doing something that in this economic climate is not easy to do, and that is uh, you know, develop a business and get results and get rare investor interest. Um, in this marketplace, as we all know, uh, the public, public investment market has really dried up. Uh, folks that have great companies with great values are deciding to wait because they know that the valuation and the investment probably won't be what it's worth. And so uh, you know, you're looking at the entrepreneurs and the smaller companies and seeing their nimbleness, their innovativeness, and uh, these are three companies that are doing exactly that. They're, they're, really, trying, they're really doing things that are quite uh, innovative and different. And at the end of the day, when, the re reason we put this, this program together is we were trying to find a theme around the web and uh, around technology that's online because we feel like in the last year, in the last two years, so much time has been spent online. So much more time is spent online because of the cost savings, because of the speed and the simplicity of getting things done online. And this trend we expect only to continue. 
both in our economy and worldwide, uh, especially with some of the uh, other nations opening up uh, access to the internet. So everything that we're going to talk about tonight is very, very relevant and will only continue to be relevant. What's also really cool about these folks um, is that they aren't necessarily, at first glance, entrepreneurs, uh, especially web-based entrepreneurs. We've got an internist, a doctor with 5,000 patients in town here. We've got a political science professor, and um, we've got other techno a technologist, and all of them turned entrepreneur, turned to the web to really launch their product, launch their business. So, a lot of versatility. I'd like to also take a moment and thank our sponsors. You can learn all about our sponsors and all about our board members on the last two pages of your program. And please do so. The, the events couldn't be possible without the help of our sponsors. But without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Antonio Brown. Antonio serves as, oversees Watch Us, which is the business that he's going to talk to you about tonight. But his background is he used to be a political science professor at Michigan, Go Blue. That's where I went. And uh, he went on to uh, start a production company and basically uh, create award-winning films. And he found himself uh, you know, looking for more distribution options. And um, instead of just kind of throwing his hands up in the air, he created his own. And that's what he's going to talk to us about. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Antonio Brown. Well, thanks to Jacques uh, and for having me here, and thanks to all of you for, for joining us. As, uh, as Jacques mentioned, uh, I started off sort of as a political science professor. Among the things I taught was political identity uh, in the media. Uh, in particular, I researched and taught about the influence of entertainment media on how we see ourselves and um, how we come to uh, become politically active, let's, let's say. And sort of from that, I got sucked into uh, actually working to produce Deuce films, um, small independent films, uh, which I am happy to say we've had a tiny bit of success with uh, and certainly some critical uh, acclaim and awards. And I felt uh, the, then the next step was to develop a way that we could go from actually developing a script, shooting it, having our film, to handling uh, the distribution. And we see, really, these days um, that film distribution, uh, consumption of entertainment in general, really is moving towards, if not fully already, has moved to the web. And uh, we felt strongly that we were in a place to take some advantage of that, um, not only in terms of uh, distributing our own product, but supporting uh, the mission of other independent uh, filmmakers. And so we came up with this concept of, of Watch Us, um, which will not only uh, provide a portal uh, to, in order to view uh, the films and uh, short films, narrative documentaries, which we uh, will acquire, but also, uh, I'm sorry, this, is, this phone's going. I'm not sure will not only allow us the opportunity to show these or feature the various films and formats um, that we're interested in, but we're also interested in developing a, um, an e-commerce component to it so that we know, uh, as all of you do, that folks who uh, are in, go on to the internet or use it as a means of entertainment, et cetera, are always multitasking. And whether we not like it or not, even when we go to see a film in a theater these days, it's rare that someone isn't sitting there texting while the film is going on. So we're doing multiple things as we consume media all the time. And this, uh, I think, will afford us an opportunity to allow people to actually view a film, um, do some shopping, which I'll get to later, and even share that experience with, uh, with friends, all while they're online at the same time. But I, I'll take a step back just to give you a little bit of the basis of, of where we're coming from and really a bit of the philosophy that, that led me to wanting to do this. Um, film festivals are hugely popular these days 
there are hundreds of new film festivals coming along each year. And um, with the digital age, with a lot of the technology that has made the internet um, what it is, uh, we see more and more filmmakers presenting more and more films. And there just simply aren't enough venues and outlets to allow this, uh, to allow all of these films to be seen and shared. Uh, many high quality films, um, frankly, you won't have an opportunity to see um, without, I think, um, this easy access to distribution. I was just talking, one great example of a little film that um, my last film was in competition with, uh, we won one award, they won the other, uh, is Frozen River. Uh, their lead actress right now is nominated for an, act, um, an Oscar award. Uh, it's a great movie, much smaller budget. It did have a commercial release, very small. Fortunately, uh, they got some momentum, and um, now, of course, people are quite interested because they've received the award. But it's, it's just that type of film that I would hope uh, Watch Us would be able to secure and feature. We're looking at um, films budgeted $5 million or less that really have a grassroots kind of appeal and um, that are beginning filmmakers uh, primarily and providing opportunities for them to have their work seen and also to gain some revenue. Um, when we think about the audience for Watch Us, we believe, uh, you know, obviously there's a general audience there, but again, when you think about the hundreds and really literally throughout this nation and worldwide, thousands of film festivals, um, you have a wonderful film festival here that just uh, passed in January, and um, we know that those audiences are there. We know those audiences love um, and are very loyal to films and really have a sort of a grassroots sensibility about their commitment to, let's say, quote unquote, art house style films. Um, generally, what we're seeing is, and certainly there's a great, there will be competition in this field, which we think is a plus, but in general, what we're seeing is that um, the quality technology uh, in terms of viewing entertainment media of this sort online is really reserved for the highest end films. Uh, the films with the moderate to lower budgets aren't getting the kind of attention that we feel that they deserve and certainly the filmmakers feel that they deserve and importantly the audiences who love this kind, these kinds of films and are happy to support this kind of filmmaking would like to see them have. So we believe that the consumer base is there and in fact will be particularly, attra particularly attracted to us because of uh, the grassroots element that we have. Our, myself as an independent filmmaker and founder of this and our commitment to those filmmakers and making these films available um, for those audiences who support and believe in, in independent filmmaking. Um, but in order to sort of really make this pay off for everyone that's involved, we thought it was important to add an extra element, if you will. Obviously, we anticipate um, revenue from subscribers. We anticipate revenue from sponsors and advertisers. But what we believe we're going to provide that's offering something a little bit new and unique is the opportunity um, for e-commerce. We, uh, in working with filmmakers, want to make available items of cloth t-shirts, shoes, novels, things that are featured in various films that um, we believe the audience will want. And we will then present an opportunity for the audience, for the viewer to purchase those items that they see in the film and also share that experience with their friends so there'll be a sort of social connection involved in it as well. So we believe this e-commerce uh, will afford us a different opportunity and a novelty and a bit of a uniqueness. And we've got, I, I think, a plan that's gonna make that work and pay off for everyone involved. With that, I want to give you a chance just to take a look at a brief demo reel that'll give you an idea in terms of adding this element to, to viewing. We're hoping to actually make this a reality and make it a reality um, that is accessible, but also supportive, again, of the filmmaker.
Now, obviously, we're very interested in generating revenue, but I believe that we can do it in a way that supports the goals of the independent filmmaker and keeps that form of entertainment alive for us. So cool, so cool. I can uh, can only imagine. Uh, so does it work like, uh, is there an account that is established to make that process go so fast? Yes, okay. yes. The um, subscriber or viewer would establish an account uh, provide their credit card number, mailing address, et cetera, on the front end so that purchases could be uh, sort of verified as we go through. You wouldn't have to do all of that registration in the midst of the film. Yeah, I think for me, I'd like to have it, like, capped at, like, you know, $300 a movie. You know, <laughs> if you start integrating travel and leisure and you say, yeah, that's where James Bond was hanging out. I'd like to go there for a week and that snowboard, that watch. So, thank you. Our next presenter is Dr. is Dr. Christopher Geiler. Uh, Chris Geiler has a practice here in town. He's an internist. Chris is a diplomat on the American Board of Internal Medicine. He's chairman uh, Department of Medicine at Cottage Hospital. And he has launched a couple of businesses in the last year. One of them is Chart Medica, who we're going to hear which we're going to hear about today, and another is Medicues, kind of like WebMD but written by doctors, not by administrative people. And Chart Medica is a tool that allows you to request, monitor, control, manage, and share your medical records online. And uh, Chris is going to tell us all about it. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Christopher Geiler. Thank you, Jacques, and thank you to the MIT Central Coast Forum for inviting me and Chart Medica here tonight. I'm excited to be here to share with you the vision of Chart Medica and its objective. And as a doctor, um, I believe this product will save lives and at least uh, improve healthcare. So, without further delay, I'd like to tell you a little bit about Chart Medica. So, Chart Medica was founded in 2008, and it is a tool for you to request, review, and permanently store your medical records securely on online. And um, that may seem like an easy process, but it's not. It, it's, it's actually very complicated. And um, there are legal questions involved in requesting your medical record. There are processes involved. There's a, a methodology involved. And unless this is followed exactly, you will not succeed in obtaining your medical records. But with Chart Medica, you can. So when I talk about chart medicas, what, what am I, or when I talk about medical records, what am I talking about? It certainly is your doctor's notes or reports about you from your physician, but it, it also includes your, your EKGs, your, your chest x-rays. Uh, medical records include your mammograms, your pap smears. Uh, medical records include your laboratories, your cholesterol level and your glucose level and liver function and uh, tumor markers. It's basically the diagnostics of your body. And I use the word diagnostics both technically and scientifically here because I'm going to show you in a minute that in some cases, the diagnostics of your car are already available online. So Chart Medica allows you to do this with a rather simple and automated process. What does Chart Medica allow you to do? Number one, Chart Medica allows you to take ownership of your medical record. It empowers you to learn a little bit more about your physiology, to learn more about your medical history, to learn more about illnesses that you may have fought or bones that you may have broken, about how your body or your physiology has changed over the last 5, 10, or 15 years. With knowing more about your medical record, you, you are better able to engage your physician. An, an educated patient is better able to participate with healthcare decisions, and ultimately this all leads to better healthcare. So, online medical records are long overdue. So, let's look currently at what we have available online. Bank accounts. I'm sure everybody here has a bank account, and your bank account has the ability to be accessed online to review deposits, to review checks you have written. 
credit card statements. Credit card statements are also available online, and you can review transactions that you've made. If you, if you paid for the presentation tonight with your credit card, that would be available to you online. Your automobile uh, maintenance records. So there are systems available, including the GM OnStar, that um, will track the, the diagnostics of your car, like the, the oil level or the tire pressure, and it is all tracked um, online. Um, additionally, your investment portfolio, like your, your stocks, um, which can be available um, online and in real time, although you may not be following it in real time on the current economic um, <laughs> environment. Um, also, your credit scores. Credit scores are available online, and that's important in purchases and, and making investments. Um, so with all of these things available online, your, your, the health of your car, your finances, why not your medical record? So, um, so before talking more about Chart Medica, um, I'll tell you a little bit about myself. Um, like Jock said, I'm a diplomat on the American Board of Internal Medicine. I'm the chairman of the Department of Medicine at Cottage Hospital. I started this company uh, called uh, Medicus, which uh, is similar to WebMD. Um, it's distinct in that it's only uh, based on physicians and um, not a random editor who writes about medicine without uh, medical education. <laughs> so um, let me tell you about a story. Uh, the story is about a patient named Nancy. So Nancy is not her, her real name. Nancy is a name I used to protect her, um, her identity. But Nancy is a patient who had a diagnosis of breast cancer. And she underwent an evaluation. She had pathology reports done. She underwent treatment. She came to me as a new patient. And I diagnosed her with, um, with breast cancer again. Um, unfortunately, her physician had retired. And, and those medical records were unavailable. So the bottom line is that we were not able to get the medical records. There are also other problems in, in healthcare today, and, and they include um, failures in communication. A failure in communication is when, uh, for example, you leave your physician's appointment and you spend a lot of time talking about your liver, but you leave the appointment and you think, is my liver okay? We talked about it. But you really didn't understand the appointment. There are also other problems, physicians coming to uh, appointments with, without a medical record, patients being sent to, to specialists and not knowing why they were sent. Compounding all of this is, is just a general shortage of doctors. And along with a general shortage of doctors, a, there's a general shortage of time that's available for you with your physician. The current data shows that the, the amount of time you spend with your physician during an, uh, a visit is about 18 minutes. If, you are, um, if your medical record is, is not available or inaccurate, it, it, it is just not going to be addressed. There's, there's not enough time. All of this leads to, to medication errors and, and misdiagnosis. So what's the answer? The answer is really the patient. So, so Health 2.0 is a social movement that empowers and enables patients through technology with the ultimate goal of improving health care. And just, just as many of you before, you, before you see your physician, you may look up your symptoms online. Um, what I'm proposing is that you also be prepared for those appointments with your physician, that you obtain an accurate and complete medical history. But who owns your medical record? That question wasn't completely clear until 2003. What, did the doctor own your medical record, or, or was that, did the physician, or did the, did the patient own, own the medical record? The last HIPAA legislation actually defined that although the physician owns the paper file of your medical record, you own the information and you have access to that information. So this was actually the foundation of Chart Medica, patient access to their medical record. A, a side point of, of the last HIPAA legislation was that if, if you encountered an, an error in your medical record, you could, um, you could petition a correction just in the same manner you petition a correction when um, when you have an error in your, your credit report. So Chart Medica was uh, designed, um, in designing Ch Chart Medic, we made a simple interface to allow you to request and review your medical records. With a Chart Medic account, you can request your medical records from a doctor or hospital. You can review your medical records online you can organize your health profile. So 
Welcome to Chartmedica. This is an example of a user on Chartmedica. Um, this particular page, the, the user has already signed in, and, and they're interested in obtaining a medical record. What they're currently doing is they've, they've decided that they are looking for a physician. They're starting to enter, I think it's probably my name, uh, as, a, as a caregiver. We have a database of 500,000 um, patients and, and 500,000 physicians and facilities. Once a physician or facility is identified, you have the option to choose the type of record that you would like to request. And um, for example, if you, um, you're not sure if you had bronchiectasis. You saw a pulmonologist a couple years ago and you really were not sure, did, did he say I had bronchiectasis? Do I have something wrong with my lungs? And you wanted to review it. You can choose to obtain his doctor's notes. There's options on here that allow you to identify what you're requesting so when the records come back, you can organize it clearly. Other options available here are to, um, are to be HIPAA compliant. So this is an example of what happens after, um, after you, you submit a request and the request is received by Chartmedica. Chartmedica will, will contact you and tell you your, your record has been received. Um, you have the option to describe the record for, for future reference. And um, your physician or hospital, once a record is sent, your physician or hospital has about 30 days uh, per HIPAA re uh, uh, regulation to, to respond to your request. If they can't respond within 30 days, they need to identify a reason why. So Chartmedica's primary pur purpose was to request, review, and permanently store medical records on online. We have additional features. There's a uh, feature for you to enter in your medical conditions. Um, for example, up here you have diabetes. Chartmedica has a function where it will search the internet for headlines and research associated with your medical conditions. There's also options for you to follow your medications and to keep track of appointments. On the right side there is, a, the, medic, is the option for the medical records. You can see at the very top there's a medical record that has been requested and received and is ready to be reviewed and approved by the user. Chartmedica is very secure. It uses the same kind of technology as your bank. We use a secure socket layer, a 128-bit 20, 120 encrypted database that it is impossible to breach, but if a hacker did breach it, it's encrypted, so the data would not be visible. We have a strict privacy policy. What about data security? The, the facilities we use are, is an SAS-70 Type 2 facility, a dedicated server, an enhanced firewall protection, and a patrol 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. So this um, Chartmedica is, is, is a real option to real healthcare problems that, that your doctor and I doctor and I face every single day. Uses for Chartmedica. The obvious uses for Chartmedica are obtaining medical records for, for yourself, for your kids or your spouse. Another option is elderly parents. For example, if you had a elderly, elderly parent with, um, with Alzheimer's and you couldn't participate with their health care, you could sign up an account for your elderly parent, request records, and really review their, their prognosis and, and their treatment regimen. So other uses for Chartmedica. Um, people, Chartmedica is really meant for everybody, but, char but special uses would, would include people who have chronic conditions, who seek frequent referrals, people who are looking for second opinions, people that move frequently. Um, new insurance. Um, we are looking to partnership with insurance companies to actually lower insurance costs for Chartmedica subscribers. Uh, a Chartmedica patient would be, uh, would be a better patient and more compliant with their with our treatment regimen, and ultimately it would save money. You could follow your medication list, family history, and you could record your family history for, or your personal history for your family, for your, for your children and for your grandchildren. And look up symptoms. So other services that we're offering through Chartmedica, one is a, something called the Chartmedica card. Chartmedica card is, an, is a form of an AD card that will allow emergency care personnel to, uh, to access your account in case of an emergency. And that could truly save your life.
Another service that we're working on is something called the Chart Medica Healthcare Audit, and, and this is a service in which a medical doctor would review your medical record and offer you comments and suggestions on, on your medical conditions. Who do we see as a potential user for Chart Medica? Well, we suspect moms. Moms are uh, women influence 85% of all the healthcare decisions and control about 80% of all household purchases. The potential users for Chart Medica are really um, everybody. Everybody who has uh, seen a physician or has a medical problem, which would be 116 million households in the United States. Um, we're hoping to uh, be enrolling 20,000 new users by the, by the end of the year, per month by the end of the year. Um, we're focusing on online and offline uh, channels targeting women between 26 and 49 years of age. Um, so with the federal economic stimulus plan, there was money and tax credits that have been set aside to develop or to allow physicians to buy um, electronic medical records. We see Chart Medica as a bridge solution to, to electronic medical record systems where Users of Chart Medica could download um, their physician's database and share it with other physicians or, or permanently store it. So Chart Medica is currently in beta. We are adding new users um, every day. We're interviewing users for uh, feedback. And we're adding new features. We are adding the healthcare audits. We're planning on adding an interface with the iPhone. And we're building the support team and, and other processes. So we're starting an, an aggressive marketing campaign in March, and we're, our database includes um, 500,000 physicians and, and facilities, so watch for us. So this is our competition. So um, there's a lot of big names up there, um, but Chart Medica is different. Um, the biggest names up there, uh, Google and, and Microsoft, are, are really um, limited, have limited functionality and, and really um, focus in on, um, on patient enter data, which is uh, like uh, I am allergic to penicillin, which, which that's, that's important to know and it's important to save and it's important to share with your physician, but it's not as important as your diagnostics, your, your EKG, your chest x-ray, your mammogram, your doctor's notes. In. And that's what we focus on is the automated record collection of, of your, the diagnostics of your body, not just patient enter data. So as a physician, I think that they've really kind of missed the boat. Um, the, the most important part of the medical record is, is what your doctor thought. So Chart Medica's business model. Um, we offer a free account and free record storage. Uh, we do charge a, a, a small fee for processing of medical records, um, which, is, which is waived uh, during our beta, during our beta um, cycle. And we will be um, charging for health audits and uh, the Chart MediCard. So Chart Medica is expanding. Um, we're looking to raise additional capital for yeah. <laughs> for additional staff and new product development, marketing and partnerships. So are you ready for Chart Medica? You can sign up for a free account at chartmedica.com and investors can contact us at invest at Chart Medica. So, um, Chris, how long does it take the average person to set up their medical records? Setting up a Chart Medic account is actually very simple. And it would take about two or three minutes to enter your data and obtain an account. Okay. And you were saying that there is a cost for processing? Yeah. Um, the, the cost is, is currently being waived um, during our beta cycle. It, it's about five ninety nine, dollars and, and that's really just to cover our costs uh, associated with processing the records. $5.99? $5.99. $5 .99. Wow. Seems really, really reasonable to keep track of uh, your medical diagnostics, as you said. Thank you, Chris. Thanks. Awesome. Well, that's, that's huge. It's actually, um, I don't know, I mean, the numbers have to be, you know, I'm let uh, Jim and John talk more about this, but the numbers seem to be, for those, uh, for those that price point, they would have to be really 
high volume to uh, start generating profit. So it sounds like a lot of this is coming really from a, from a physician's point of view, like uh, trying to save lives, like you said. So that's awesome. Well, terrific. So the next presenter is Joe Andrew. He's the founder and CEO of SwitchBook. Uh, everybody here uses Google or has used Google. And uh, what Joe wants to do is show you better ways and the more recent technology that he's been working on for some time. Um, I think it's so you know, interesting about Joe, and besides him being an awesome speaker and having a, a pretty varied and full background in this space, is that um, they're still developing their actual application. Now, we're going to get uh, one of the most inside glimpses that uh, he's given to any public today with some screenshots. But, uh, but okay. Awesome. So we're going to get an inside glimpse on that, but uh, even with just a, a good business plan um, and, a, and Joe's explanation, he, they have been able to raise half a million dollars with the National uh, Science Foundation, which is just a staggering uh, success story in this climate. So are you ready, Joe? Okay. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Joe Andrew. Um, thanks, Jacques. So uh, what I'm going to be talking about is something we call user-driven search, and I'll tell you a little bit about how uh, we funded ourselves to date. So we believe that search has outgrown Google. In fact, Google's own research has shown that the average travel search takes 29 days from the first query to actually making a purchase. So for these types of searches, we're going everywhere. We're not just searching at Yahoo and Google. We're also searching at eBay. We're searching at Amazon. We're searching at Wikipedia. We're searching at focused retailers and shopping comparison sites. All of this is search activity, even though you might think of search engines as where you search. So we spend a lot of time. We go to a lot of different places, and we make a lot of discoveries. So in short, we need more than keywords and pages and pages of results. So SwitchBook helps with these kinds of advanced searches. We track specific user-selected searches. So the user turns us on for uh, planning their vacation, or looking for a home, or finding a job. And we track your search history, your browser history, and the discoveries that you make along the way. You can go anywhere online. You can save and continue your search at any time. And then we recommend websites that other people with similar searches have already discovered. So we do that with search maps. So for the browsing history, we keep track of the search providers that you visit, the queries that you enter at those search providers, the results that you click on, and the pages that you actually uh, end up at. We also give you a digital scrapbook of these discoveries. So you can grab an image, a paragraph, a sentence, an entire page. Um, you can make notes. You can organize it into folders or collages or charts. In essence, we're giving you a way to capture an extremely rich expression of your search intent, which is focused on that particular search, your vacation or your new home. And it is editable, it's savable, it's printable, and it's shareable. And the most important thing is that it is owned and controlled by the user. This is your electronic document, just like your spreadsheets or your Word documents. And we, in fact, make it easy for you to share this document with any search provider capable of understanding it on your own terms. So in short, search maps are a new way to manage and express your search intent anywhere to anyone. And we call that user-driven search. So a bit about uh, me and what we're doing. So uh, the first venture I got any significant funding for was in 1999. It's an interactive stories company. Uh, with technology for online games. And we spent the next year trying to raise money in a collapsing market. Um, uh, the next project was with Navixcel, uh, which I wrote both the client side and server side piece of a browser plugin that helped monetize um, errors in the address bar. So if you have a typo or you go to the wrong place, we would make money off that. We got to 3 million downloads before I left that company. And in 2005, I was a partner in a company called Ceilings Unlimited, based here in Santa Barbara, uh, that developed a climate change TV show funded by the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration's SBIR program, Small Business Innovation Research. We got a phase one and a phase two grant. 
And that was the first experience I had um, with federal grants at all. And it was that SBIR program that ended up funding SwitchBook. So I first thought of this uh, literally the week after the Super Bowl in 2006. I was reading a book called The Search by John Battelle. And uh, I realized I could just start programming this. So I did. Uh, towards the end of the year, I brought on a team. Um, and at the beginning of 2007, went out to try and raise private equity. And uh, we were just a little too early. Um, we didn't. We hadn't yet figured out how we talk about what we were doing. We didn't have a really. We didn't have a good prototype to show. And in the midst of all of that, um, we lost our CTO. So it torpedoed a couple conversations that we were in. And uh, fortunately, during that phase, we had also applied for a grant from the Advanced Technology Program from the U.S. Department of Congress and the National Science Foundation's Small Business Innovation Research Program. And I also sold my interest in Ceilings Unlimited and put that into the company. So it was huge for us to get the funding from uh, the National Science Foundation. Initially, it was just $100,000. That's the phase one. Um, and then phase two, which uh, we, we just recently got, uh, is $500,000. I'm going to walk you through what it took to get that. So I think an interesting question for an entrepreneur looking to get funding today is why? Why do they fund us? I think for phase one, um, it was actually because we were doing search in a very different way. Uh, what we're doing is not based on PageRank. PageRank is the core algorithm behind Google, and both Yahoo and Microsoft use variants of that to figure out what pages uh, to rank at the first in your searches. So uh, we're doing something completely different. And with this search map, we're working with search at, at a much higher abstraction. So it allows both the users and the search providers to look at that 29-day long uh, search instead of just, what's this query and how do we respond to that? Uh, it also leverages prior learnings from other users. And this was highlighted by our program director at NSF as one of the main reasons uh, that they were excited about what we were doing. And the example he gave was, imagine a mother who has just learned that their child has leukemia. This mother is going to be doing some online research to try and figure out what just happened. What does this mean to her life? What are the symptoms? What are the treatments? What are the support networks out there? What can they do about this situation? They're going to spend a lot of time on it. So our technology allows this mother to find the right results faster if any other mother in a similar situation has performed a similar search. So this ability to leverage um, from what other people beforehand have already learned was the main reason that NSF backed us for phase one. Also, I think it was important, we were not buzzword compliant. We're not doing semantic web, which is the current project of Tim Berners-Lee, who created the World Wide Web. And we're also not doing natural language understanding. That's a really hard problem. A lot of companies are putting a lot of money into it. I think PowerSet is probably the most famous. They are building off of 10 years of work at Xerox PARC. Um, so we're not buzzword compliant, and I think NSF liked that, because we were zigging while everyone else was zagging. For phase two, um, a big part of it was we had really good results for phase one. So we have a very lightweight semantic approach in terms of how we figure out who has a similar search map. You get two search maps, we want to make recommendations based on that. So we have a very lightweight way to do that. And our results show that uh, our approach was faster computationally, um, but as good as the best of class um, at, at the, the scope of the level we were working at. Um, Errol Arkelich, our program director, also liked our vision. He said it was great, it's big. We don't want to fund companies that see themselves being a $10 million a year company. We want to create billion dollar industries that change our country. And he said, fact is, we're a little bit scared that your vision's so big, you need $10 million to do what you're talking about. So the, the funny thing was that in the same breath that he said that, he said, but we believe you can get to market in six months so note that you can do all these crazy, fun, interesting, semantic uh, uh, improvements and take what you did in phase one, build a product, and get it to market as soon as you can. So uh, he made it very clear that was why they funded us, so that we could get to market. So the assets that we brought to the table, a lot of sweat equity. So I've been working on this for three years. Uh, I've put in less than $50,000 of my own money and a little bit of consulting revenue along the way and just some skills. I mean, you sat down and started programming. Uh, I have a ma marketing background. 
Um, and the people I brought on board are really rock star uh, talent. Um, also some project management and writing, and I think that's really important because what we actually did to get this money was we wrote. We wrote a 15-page narrative with a work plan, discussion of the scientific merit, and a commercialization plan. And then, of course, we had to have a budget and bios and letters of support. And the result was $100,000 to cover six months of research. We applied in June of 2007. We got the award. We were notified in October. And then we actually got our first check in January of 08 and covered through to June of last year. Now, for phase two, I had to do a little bit more work. Uh, so a 15-page technical plan, a 15-page commercialization plan, and uh, we had to include the 15-page phase one final report. Now, we had to write that anyway. Um, but still, it was a lot of work, all this written in a month's uh, time frame. Also, we need the budget, bios, and letters of support. And so that's given us $500,000 for 12 months. Normally, it's 24, um, but Errol at uh, NSF is willing to accelerate that for us. Uh, we applied in July, so a month after we wrapped up phase one. We were notified in November. Uh, we actually got the official award letter uh, February 4th, and we actually haven't gotten the money yet. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, literally, it could come tonight uh, via the ACS. So you know, I'm checking my online banking, and uh, hopefully there will be a, more than $100,000 in our account tomorrow, which would be great because i got to make payroll. And that's it. <laughs> Thanks, Jack. Well, I think the NSF knows what they're talking about. Thank you, Joe. Uh, Joe, how is it different than, how is the, the technology and the data that you're actually capturing and using different than traditional environment variables and bookmark tracking and just history that most of the uh, browsers these days are already capturing? So we combine um, what we call both implicit and explicit data in an intentional package. And I'll sort of unwrap that. So uh, a lot of services like DoubleClick, um, which is now owned by Google, track you as you go around the internet. If you're seeing an ad that DoubleClick's provided, they're watching. So they use that to track your, your attention data. Um, but they don't have a way for you to edit it correct it, package it, separate your travel search from your vacation planning, mm. from your adult entertainment. So um, we also let you grab things that you found, right? So an airfare or a hotel or that snorkeling excursion. So you can just grab part of the page, which a bookmarking service doesn't let you do. Now, there are scrapbooking services out there. Google Notebook actually just tabled their uh, product. Um, Yahoo just launched SearchPad. So, but nobody sort of unified these together. And I think the most important difference with what we're doing versus sort of the whole intention data model, uh, and it's sort of the Netflix problem as well. We're not trying to figure out what's the perfect page for you, your entire life, the essence of who you are, because we know everything about you. We're trying to say, look, you're doing a search right now. And for that kind of search, this is where you're going. So it's very focused yeah. to right now what you're looking for. So it's almost like real-time thinking and anticipating and That's right. using even more data than any of these other tools. Well, actually, we're using less. Oh. That's sort of part of the beauty. So um, when uh, – what's a good example? Uh, we're not analyzing your entire search history and all the different places that you've been. We're using just what's in that search map. So we're not trying to figure out you know, from your demographics – or from past behavior other than this search, what you want to do. We're finding out, based on what you put in here, what it is you're looking for. Mm. So this, the, the example of the mother with leukemia, you know, it's what she's doing right now that matters. Because you know what? None of her previous searches ever had anything to do with leukemia. Hmm. Fascinating. Really cool. So we're going to open up to questions for everybody. But first, let me tell you to, about uh, the couple of gentlemen at the end of the table here. And these two guys are uh, really responsible for fueling companies like these three. Um, first at the very end is Jim Adelman. Jim is the general partner and found, co-founder of Rincon Ventures, which is uh, a firm providing fun funding and investment consulting for Southern California, primarily Southern California-based web companies. 
Um, he's got more than 15 years experience in venture capital investing in technology and investment banking and, and provides advisory services, strategic business consulting. And to his left is John Isaacson, who's the chairman of Pasadena Angels. And uh, for those of you that have not heard of Pasadena Angels, they're one of the most notable uh, angel investment groups all up and down the coast, all, all over California, really. A hundred member group, they've invested $15 million over the last um, eight years, since 2000. To, with uh, 60 companies ranging in nanotechnology, hydrogen sensing, software development, and entertainment. So it sounds like there's some pretty good matches up here. And you know what we're really looking for is uh, feedback from these guys because they see deals and opportunities all the time. So before we uh, open up the, uh, the floor for questions to anybody, I'd like to ask the three entrepreneurs, you know, in this current economic climate where people are starting to spend less and uh, they're holding back, and they're sort of uh, more careful than ever. What made you guys decide to start investing in a new company? Uh, for Chart Medica, this was the, the optimal time. There's a, the ho whole social movement of patients being involved in their medical care is kind of peaking. And healthcare is usually not impacted by the economy. Uh, I think experience has told many of us that when we face the rough, um, rough economic times, uh, folks want to be entertained all the more. <laughs> and uh, allowing this sort of web-based form of entertainment actually um, allows, uh, allows it to happen in a more affordable way. So I think this is a wonderful uh, time and opportunity for this. So it's inter obviously I uh, started well before the collapse of the current economy. Um, but we're also part of a movement uh, called user-driven services. And uh, it's really about putting the user in charge and trying to use the fact that the user in charge to create an intention economy. So to be able to figure out what is the user trying to do right now and fulfill that demand rather than trying to impose on their attention, which is sort of the classic model, which is kind of your model. Um, but I like that you're working with the, the producer, the filmmaker, to, to, to have it be contextual sensitive. But, you know, the, the whole mass media industry is about the attention industry. There's a book called The Attention Economy. There's this movement towards the intention economy that uh, I think is actually far more important right now for the economy because it reduces guesswork for companies. Um, and it, it, if companies can be responsive to it, um, they actually know what the market wants before they produce it. Mm -hmm. And actually, for, uh, for Jim and John, if you guys can address... You know what has happened in the funding markets and in the last year or so, and what what's uh, what, what you're looking at more carefully than ever now. Oh, by all means, <laughs> is this on? Hi. Um, you know, one of the things that I think a lot of people think is that the angel investors have sort of headed for the hills in this environment and one of the things that I do on a regular rather routine basis is I tell our membership don't head for the hills let's just look for the opportunities because in a curious way the companies that we invest in are not really that economically sensitive because they're very young they're starting in new technologies and whatever they're doing they're such a small part of the market that they're trying to address that if the market shrinks by 10 percent uh, it doesn't make a lot of difference. Now, what has changed is the ability to get the follow-on financing because the model that angel investors used to have is you put a reasonable amount of money into a company, say half a million dollars, get it up to hit certain milestones, and then get the VCs to follow at a considerably higher valuation with 10 million or whatever, whatever dollars. And... It's that second piece that has become iffier in many cases. So what we find ourselves talking about a lot is we have to see some sustainability to these companies. When I first got involved in this, someone said to me, John, the trick to these companies is just keep them going. And I thought, that's not very smart. And the more I thought about it, the more I realized it is very, very smart because you get bright, dedicated people like these and frankly, the first way that they go about it probably isn't going to work. But if they've got at the core what is a good idea, 
and they can keep poking at it and learn a little bit more about the market or how to address the market, then they, then they have a chance. So, you know, in thinking about all three of these companies, all of them are dealing with interesting issues. Uh, health records, product placement, distribution of film, um, the, the, the advanced search techniques. These are all things that we've been seeing. What makes it a little bit difficult for me is I'm used to, as a part of a presentation, seeing some financial projections. And I know that most of the time the financial projections are wrong. I've actually gone back and looked at all the companies that we funded to see where they are after three years, because in the pro formas we get, they're always at somewhere between five and 10 million. And I could count on the fingers of this hand the number of companies that got to five to 10 million in that time frame. But what we really want to see is if we give you the money, where are you going to be after three years? Are you going to be with a sustainable cash flow position? Or are you going to be in a, in a position where you really can raise more money? To give you money with the expectation that you're going to be able to raise more money in this current environment doesn't really work. So that's, that's what I think of. And in two of the presentations here seem to me had too many moving parts. There were too many things that had to work right and work at the same time. So it was going to qu require quite a bit of capital initially, which I think would be difficult to raise uh, in this environment. On the other hand, something that we've been kicking around is if we get interesting companies with interesting technologies, why can't we encourage them to get SBIR funding? So I think you know the idea to go out and get some funding from other sources in this environment makes makes a lot of sense. In the end, what the angels provide in addition to the capital is, is mentoring. And you know that I don't think you're going to get from the SBIR. But um, I think that's one thing that you can get from, from the angels groups. I probably talked too much. Thanks, John. Uh, Jim? The question again? <laughs> You know, just uh, what, what's what's going on on your what's end of the on? Uh, on your end of the neighborhood uh, right now? Yeah, there's a lot going on. Um, let me preface first. This evening is about uh, web-based startups. You can see from just the three presentations that we heard how broad and varied and heterogeneous that um, ostensibly small slice of the overall investment landscape is. Um, it's one of the reasons it's so much fun to do what I do, because there's such incredible variety. So uh, on one, I am inherently forced to be a generalist. So uh, I'm a little bit humbled sitting here because I see a bunch of internet operators out in the audience who know more about what, the, you know, everyone, there's someone in this room that knows more about everything than I do. Um, so uh, hopefully I'll still provide some, some valuable thoughts. Uh, the other is that just as the web startup or web-based business uh, is by no means a homogeneous entity, uh, uh, so too with venture capital. So I'm giving you a perspective. There's no way I can give you the venture capital perspective because there is no such thing. Uh, uh, I can, and, I, and I will distinguish to the best of my ability uh, my perspective versus perhaps the typical VC. Um, uh, spot on uh, comment about the scarcity of follow-on financing. Um, I'll, I'll, and there's a, there's a, there is a legitimate rationale for it. Um, there are many venture-backed businesses whose plan from inception was to have a burn rate until an exit. Uh, and, and, uh, and certain high-profile public outcomes reward that conception. Right? YouTube had virtually no revenue when they went public. Facebook had virtually no revenue and they got a $15 billion valuation with Microsoft. Skype had virtually no revenue and they were bought for billions. Uh, Twitter just did a, you know, in this environment, just did a $35 million round at a $230 million pre-money valuation with no revenue. Uh, so those, uh, that feedback mechanism, that encouragement of that sort of investment approach is, is still out there even in this environment. Uh, so 
the VC who puts in the A round or the B round is expecting that burn rate that occurs until exit and perhaps even grows until exit, they expect that to be funded by subsequent follow-on rounds with new outside leads. Uh, and the problem is that uh, that has disappeared. And that becomes self-reinforcing because if I know that I have to carry my own portfolio companies for a longer period of time, mm -hmm. then I have less new money for new deals. Because a venture capital fund uh, has a finite pool of capital commitments. So then all of a sudden, even, you know, I have, not me in particular, but if I'm that typical VC that has a portfolio full of companies with a big burn rate, uh, all my money, I might, yesterday, half my fund was still available. And today I have to recalculate all my reserves and I might find that I'm out. I have no new money for new deals because the worst thing in the world is to have a great company that's doing wonderfully and not have the, the resources to support it. So better to save that money to support your existing portfolio than uh, put money out in new deals. So that and, and again, like I said, that feeds on itself because if I'm doing that, then you're doing that and you're doing that and, and everyone is stuck just sort of trying to uh, save the most likely winners in their existing portfolio. So one of the things I've grown fond of saying lately is it's, it's a terrific time to be doing new deals and it's a crappy time to have portfolio companies. <laughs> uh, Rincon is a little different because uh, since our, uh, our inception was, was based on this premise that there's an underserved portion of the overall landscape, um, a venture capital firm, if they can, will raise more money because it's in the economic interest of the individual partner. But that means they have to deploy money in larger chunks. That means they do fewer deals. That means they do bigger deals. That means they do later stage deals. Meanwhile, we're at a time in history, as demonstrated by these three gentlemen here, where it has never cost less to launch and build certain types of businesses. Uh, and you know, the, the promising businesses that has a very high probability of success that might only need a couple of million dollars and the most likely outcome is a $50 million exit, which by the way was about the average VC backed exit in, in 07, which wasn't even that horrible a year. Uh, no one on Sand Hill Road is going to be interested in that. And if you structure that deal appropriately and, and align incentives, there's a tremendous spectrum of outcomes. It can be a huge win for an investor and for an operator. So that's sort of a uh, long-winded way of saying our, our approach has been uh, focus on those capital-efficient businesses uh, that can take a modest amount of capital a long way and have a, and have a higher probability of a great outcome for everyone involved. Um, there is uh, tremendous scarcity of uh, capital for startups these days. I, I concur absolutely that, uh, that uh, I think it's a great time to be investing in early stage businesses. Uh, I think early stage businesses are, if anyone's familiar with financial theory, is all about alpha, has nothing to do with beta, meaning you know the success of these small businesses are not correlated with the overall market, or very, very poorly correlated with the overall market, as opposed to uh, you know uh, the CBS or Yahoo or GM uh, that is very highly correlated. Um, that said, it's a it's a it's a different time. Um, the there are still deals getting done, absolutely. Uh, I, I commented earlier. I'm still you know surprised every day at the valuations that certain deals are getting done at. Hmm. Uh, and I got to figure out how to get me some of that for my portfolio. Uh, the um, No one wants to say, no one in the investment community wants to say that they aren't still open for business. Uh, and so it's, it's going to be, you'll, you'll, you'll just get people not responsive uh, or slow to respond or a very, very long um, uh, assessment process because they don't want to say no because they like your deal, uh, but they can't say yes because they're afraid they don't have the money. Um, the angel networks are, are vital, and angels and angel networks are a vital part of the overall ecosystem. Uh, you know, those folks don't have the luxury that I have of having a committed pool of capital. They have to go sell public equities at 40 cents, 60 cents on the dollar to invest in your startup. 
Uh, and so a lot of them are retrenching because of that. And a lot of them have their own existing portfolio where they uh, didn't think they'd have to do follow-ons because the expectation was the ones that are successful, somebody else sort of takes the takes that burden off uh, or that opportunity. Or both. Um, so it is a tough time to get angel money. Uh, and uh, uh, for me in particular in Santa Barbara, that's actually kind of a good thing because most entrepreneurs in this town who are um, uh, who have the experience uh, and credibility whereby we'd be likely to uh, support them probably know some high net worth individuals who uh, might be excited to be involved and are less sensitive to structure and and, uh, and return profiles than we mm. are so locally we've historically had a lot of competition from the rich folks <laughs> um, and uh, and there's a, there's a considerably less of that these days so uh, I think it's a good time to be investing I think it's a good time to uh, be growing a business but there is a uh, uh, a newfound appreciation for this concept of capital efficiency. I, I, I find it entertaining that that's the uh, that's the phrase du jour in, on Sand Hill Road when it's the one I've been trumpeting. For oh, that's what we're hoping to get on tape tonight. <laughs> Some other predictions. Thank you, Jim. Um, I'd like to open it up to the uh, to the floor for questions and observations, thoughts on any of the uh, presentations you saw tonight, or any other uh, questions. Yes, back. So, so the question is, how do you deal with the behemoths like uh, Google and Microsoft when you're a tiny startup? Okay. Like I said, their their model is a little bit different. They're they're really based on patient under data, and and not on medical records generated from physicians or like what I said, your diagnostics. So it is it is a different concept than theirs. Um, the, and and the user, the potential users for for these systems are are everybody. So I don't think it matters that you have big names out there. You're talking about the whole population of people who have a potential to use this service. It's it seems like it, it's a it's an opportunity. I mean, I think your point is very valid. Uh, but if if the uh, opportunity is there and, and the market is there, which it sounds like it is, you know, Chris could develop the business. Dr. Gallagher could develop the business and and be a great acquisition target for Google or Microsoft? I actually think uh, the economic situation is making it harder for Google to make mm -hmm. risky investments. They're laying people off. They're shutting projects down. The mantra at these large behemoths is focus. So um, there's actually a great opportunity in technical talent right now. So if you have a hot idea, there are smart people whose projects just got canceled, not because they aren't brilliant, but because it's no longer seen as a strategic fit. And Yahoo is going through all sorts of strategic restructuring. So um, I see that. It's a classic innovator's dilemma. Their core business is being threatened. They need to focus on that. And they're shedding a lot of innovative uh, potential little projects. Yeah, I, I agree. I think you have to be careful with the making the statement that you made a generalization. Because in one of the companies that we funded that I'm particularly close to, what we've, for years we've worried about the gorilla next door. And what we discovered last, late last year was that the gorilla was so distracted that it increased an opportunity for us. And the company had positive cash flow and had cash reserves. And we decided to commit more on a, a marketing spend rather than to, to retrench. Yes. I don't think I need an exit. exit, exit. Exit strategy. The, the the potential user base is everybody. So I think there's room for Google, and there's room for Chart Medica. And if anything, Google and I, I actually started this project about three years ago before Google and Microsoft entered the the playing field. And so it was kind of discouraging when they did it. But when I, when I looked at their business, what they were doing, I thought there's not a physician involved in these programs because what they're asking for is just not that important. Patient enter data is important. It is is important. We do that too. But, but, but that's not the goal of Chart Medica. It's, it's to collect your medical history. What, what happened to you when you were six? Was, was that whooping cough, or did, did you really have rheumatic heart fever? Uh, rheumatic fever. But, um, but anyway, the, the potential users are, are everybody. I think there's room for Google to exist and for us to exist, and we're counting on people to recognize the, the difference between the two and choose us over Google or, or over Microsoft. Yeah. 
uh, also. And, and the thing is, Chart Medic is, is just a business that's designed to help patient care, to help inform patients and allow them to participate in their health care. Google is not. Google are businessmen. They're not physicians. And in fact, when they did that, I, I got mad. I thought, they're not medical doctors. Why are they collecting medical records? What are they going to do with that? And they, they obviously don't know the importance of it. There's a question in the back here. Yeah, and I think also to tail into that, I mean, going back to Joe's point, you know, there, there is a contraction happening with these larger companies that's causing them to focus. And it, it is allowing some of these smaller companies to, to gain market share. But, but we, in my past businesses, we used to always think about it purely quantitatively. I mean, if you have 116 million household, right? Is that the number? 116. I mean, how many percentage of that do you need to really be, um, to be successful? And you know, one two percent. It's not really that um, that big of numbers to to make an impact. Now, it may not entertain. Uh, you know, Jim may not look at it. John may, but at least at that point, you know, you can get a business going. And maybe when the when the economy starts to rebound, you know, you're in a better position for you know further capital and for much much greater growth. Yes. So it's a two phase question. The first uh, part of it is for the entrepreneurs, and uh, the lady would like to know. Uh, basically, how the board has been developed so far. Is there a board? Um, what, what did that entail? And then for the uh, investors, she's interested to find out what, what has sunk a ship during a pitch, you know, during a, a presentation, what has really turned things from okay to no way, right? Actually, <clears throat> actually we are involved in de uh, developing a board. Um, which would be a combination of sort of Hollywood insiders, if you will, <laughs> um, who ha already are supportive in terms of content, which is going to be very important in driving this and making it successful. That is getting the films, um, which I'm fortunate enough to say we've got a nice library coming in. Um, and also, uh, in particular, um, what we want is to focus on expertise in marketing and technology. So those are the areas around which we're developing the board. Um, now I know I have commitment commitments from some much higher level producers so far who will certainly su support the business as we move forward. So um, I'm actually forming a new advisory board right now. We've had a, an informal advisory board uh, basically of fellows, serial entrepreneurs, uh, people who understand the marketplace or leaders in the marketplace. Um, and then I'm also uh, just now forming a technical advisory team of folks to help us standardize our search map file format. Uh, so that's folks who are uh, knee deep in the open source movement and understand how to create standards around that. So uh, we're building a board around that. We do not have a corporate board um, because at this point I own 99% of the company and I, I don't need one. <laughs> you are it. You, you respond to yourself? That's right. <laughs> okay, so Chart Medica doesn't have a corporate board either. Um, there's a group of people who are advising on, on the project, but we'll be in the process of, of developing that over time. Pretty straightforward one. Uh, I don't really care what precedes my involvement. Uh, once uh, I am involved, um, I typically take we typically take a board seat, our our, our and or our co-investors in a, in a syndicate, um, uh, and uh, the 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 best performing boards are those that are the most informed about the business and the business of growing businesses uh, that have skin in the game uh, and that uh, um, are actively engaged. Those are sort of the three most important things. I like the first question. We're ready to answer that one after, after, after John goes ahead. You know, we would, we would very much like to have real involvement uh, with the company because frequently, I shouldn't say frequently, more often than not, what we have when we get these companies is someone, maybe two people, with a bright idea, not a lot of business experience. And we think we can be really, really helpful 
in terms of keeping them out of big trouble. And one of the things that we've discovered over the years, we have information rights in all of the agreements that we have. And we find that the CEOs, as a general rule, are very reluctant to provide that information. And we try to explain to them, it's not because we want to hammer you because you didn't do what you said you were going to do. It's because we would like to put together something so we can try to identify problems early and try to solve them early. And we find the ones that provide us that information, for one thing, they're willing to work with us, tend to do a lot better than the ones that don't provide it. And that's really what we want when we put someone on a board. We want a good flow of information so that we can try to figure out what's going on and when to intervene to see if we can improve the outcome. You wanted to get back to the first one. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the first question is to some degree what the topic of the evening is, which is uh, sort of what's getting funded these days in this, uh, in this environment. And uh, uh, at least for me personally, that, that's equivalent to asking, you know, what do I like in a deal when it comes to me? Because that's the one I'm more likely to fund. Um, uh, for me, the initial hook, unquestionably, is a compelling value proposition. Uh, if there is a, you know, a screaming or an unmet need that uh, the constituent is dying to have met, uh, and this solution does a good job of filling that need, that is a great start. If that's lacking, um, all the other great stuff in the world about that business might not be enough. Uh, and I, I use the word constituent deliberately because in certain business models there are multiple constituencies. Uh, and they all have to, uh, you have to provide a compelling value proposition for all of them. So in Antonio's example, it's the most easy one. You have the filmmakers that you need to provide a compelling value proposition for in order to get them to put their content with you. Uh, you need a compelling value proposition for the consumer of that content to get them to show up. And you need a compelling uh, value proposition for your monetization partners. Um, so that's sort of the, that's what, at the end of the day, uh, understanding intimately your constituencies and what's important to them and, how you, and what their needs are and how you're going to fill them uh, is very important and very valuable. And then, specifically then for web-based businesses, the things you need to check off is, you know, do you have a viable and successful strategy for, for acquiring traffic in whatever form that, whatever your units of traffic are? Uh, it, are you capable of providing them with an outstanding user experience once you get them there? Uh, and uh, and are you, do you have a you know, viable plan and strategy and, and demonstrated success to the degree that it's available in monetizing that traffic? Uh, because that's the only way you cover your costs. So that's, that's sort of a real quick and dirty checklist, and, and if, if all of those things are necessary, if any of them are missing, uh, it's not going to be a deal we're going to do. To go to the, the question that you originally asked, when we have posted on our website uh, a series of, I think there are eight questions that we would like to see addressed when the companies come to us to... Um, to try to get considered. And what we and they they cover the gamut. You know, what's the business? What's the pain point? You know, what's the product? Why is it unique? Do you have IP? What is your financial outlook? What does your management look like? It's amazing how few people manage to answer all the questions. And because this is an MIT related group, I will tell you that technologists have the problem of getting enamored with the technology. And for getting to get to the bottom line, you have to start with the top line. So we'd really like to know how you're going to get that top line, rather than what's so great about the technology that you have. It's the whole package. And when you see only one piece, you get very nervous. Mm. Yeah, I'm sure. Any other questions out there? Yes. So the question is, how does the, what's the secret sauce? of Chart Medica, how does it actually work in terms of uh, obtaining the medical record and making it useful? <laughs> I don't know how, ex how extensive you're going to get in the response, but... The, the first part is, is, is that the record is taken by... And 
With more physicians turning to the electronic medical records, we have different ways of downloading that information. But with the whole movement of Health 2.2, Health 2.0, patients are becoming involved in their health records. And people know, patients know what hypertension is, and they know what a stroke is. So they already know what's going on. And in my personal practice over the last five years, my patients are much more sophisticated. And I think you're discounting patients by saying that they're not going to understand what's going on in their medical record. If, if I showed an EKG up here, everybody in this room would recognize it. They may not recognize that it shows a left axis deviation or the fact that the patient had had a heart attack. But the patient knows that. I had a heart attack. This is what it means. And this will be available when I go to the ER. So the ER doctor has it. Although the, the patient's not going to make a, a decision based on that diagnosis, they're going to present that to their doctor, and it's going to be available to them. So I, I, think, that, I think that Google, if, if that's the reason why Google and HealthNet are doing it, they're discounting the, the patient, and, and, and that's wrong to do today. Um, if you request a record, you, you know who the record is from. You have the ability to share that record with you, even, even if you don't understand it, even if you didn't understand the record that came. You knew who it came from, and you knew the value of it, and you could share it with your doctor. It, it's really a patient solution to share information with different doctors. The, the movement is that people are going to understand more and more about their health, just like they have access to the Internet, and they know what a stroke is. But, but, but ideally, sorry. they're going to be able to show, share this information with their doctors, with their doctor in 10 years. Yeah, during the presentation, I don't know if you saw this, um, Miss, but there was a, uh, the slide, the master view slide. It had the actual shot of the medical record, which looked like a PDF or an embedded JPEG or something there. But it also, on the right side, had all of the detail delineated. So either the patient is going to transcribe what they saw in their medical record into a specific field, or maybe the system uses OCR, optical character recognition. I don't know. But it could. It could. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I, I just I wanted to point out that I, we scanned when, when the presentation was going through. It did go pretty fast. But I, I did see an actual digitization. But I also saw fields that were, you know, adding value, hopefully. I hope it's okay for me just to throw something out. It just, uh, I have no background in this whatsoever. Um, but it, watching his presentation and hearing your exchange now reminds me of something um, re that I recently experienced um, where someone I know um, relocated to Los Angeles and um, their medical records did not follow them. And they actually had some issues that could have been very easily resolved with something like this where they can actually present their medical history to the current doctor um, for whatever reason that information did not reach the people in his new uh, home that it needed to reach in time for him to meet his situation. And so um, as a complete layperson, and uh, imagining other people um, with even, you know, with less exposure than I might have um, in terms of how to negotiate their own medical records and needs, it seems to me it fulfills a, it's a service that does fulfill a need. Now, I don't know what the competitors do, so I don't have all this background. Well, I agree with you that yeah. Doctor, yeah. And that's what I got from him personally, but I, I'm just interjecting just because. I wanted to throw out, I think you're a doctor as well, and I just wanted to throw out a lay person's observation. So uh, could the three of you describe in your own words what you consider your sustainable competitive advantage is? Uh, for myself, I'll, I'll say uh, that my own background as an independent film producer and um, Relatively, given my exposure, um, extensive contacts in that world, um, I think that I have, to some degree, a unique and sustainable access uh, to content. That and uh, and frankly, a level of um, relatability to to those who would provide content to me. 
Uh, say the question again. What's your sustainable, your unique sustainable competitive advantage? Um, I, th I think that the competitive advantage that I have with Chartmedic is I know exactly what I would like a patient to have when they come to see me. Not, not I'm allergic to penicillin. I, I want to know what your EKG was. And that's something that Chartmedic and, and HealthFault are not offering. Or, I mean, Google, Google is not offering Chartmedic. Oh, I'm Chartmedic. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's, only, that's something only Chartmedic offers. Okay. Got it. So uh, we have a patent in process uh, around our core intellectual property, and we're going to leverage that to create an open standard in the marketplace. And uh, part of that plan is really a race to create the leading database of these search maps so that we can make better recommendations. So there's a, there's a runaway uh, effect, edge effect there, network effect, um, that you know, once we have the largest database, it'll be really hard for someone else to compete with that. Thank you for the question. Can I make a comment generally? Yes, yes. Jim. Uh, one of the great things about this space, especially consumer-facing web-based businesses, is the transparency of, of what every business is doing. Uh, so that you know what all your competitors are doing. You can, you can uh, take the best features and, and, uh, and incorporate them into your own solution. That's also the worst thing about this space. <laughs> Uh, there is, there's not a lot of IP, in my opinion, in a lot of very, even very successful consumer-facing web-based businesses. So therefore, and you've heard the answer in, in two of these individuals, and that's my answer too, is it comes down to execution, and that comes down to the team. So, you know, is it a team that can uh, uh, perform well enough to carve out a big enough piece for this business to be successful? That's it. Stop. Did you want anything, John? Yeah. No. Justin, yeah. So the question is, uh, do barriers to entry even matter? You know, an example is Twitter that you're saying doesn't have much substance behind it, but it's pretty popular. Well, I mean, Twitter now has a huge barrier to entry, which is called a, an install base, if you will. Right? It's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's that network effect that a competitor can offer the exact same thing. I mean, how many, ident how many services that were virtually identical to YouTube were even better? From a user, user experience perspective, were there hundreds, and you know, YouTube exited for I think 1.6 billion dollars. You know, the second best is like 50 million. I mean, think about it. Yeah, and so, so the 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 problem is that when you're a startup and you don't have that network yet, how do you uh, develop any um, confidence that you will be the one that develops that mm -hmm. that winning position? Mm -hmm. So then. So how do the investors basically uh, look at the risk? What is the criteria to determine that this could be truly a flagship first mover type of company? Yeah. So John, you, you're going to be the first investor before uh, Jim. <laughs> well, I was going to say, if you're the first one, well, that that's a good start. But, um, you know, I guess I have a curious view about this. It's easier, I think, to identify things that are red flags that probably you want to stay away from or you want to work to try to get those red flags. But to try to identify the truly big successes, um, it's not even like tossing a coin. It's tossing some very, very strange coin that you have no idea when that head is going to show up. It sounds like a process of elimination then. No, I, you know, luck is a huge part of it. You know, you can worry about execution, and you can worry about this, and you can worry about that, and you can try to remedy it. But, you know, think of all the companies where someone else had later, arguably, the better product that didn't dominate the market. I mean, think of Apple, even though it's an outrageous success today. You know, it had clearly a better product than the DOS product. And look at what? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, with regard to this space, this is your question. I don't make that bet. Uh, I mean, the question is to agree. You know, how do you how do you pick the one that's going to be the one that succeeds in a market? I don't play in those markets because I I'm not smart enough to know what those particulars of success are. So uh, someone said that first market. 
You know, there are funds that, that, that put out 50 million bucks for a living, and, and I'm in the business of putting 2 million bucks, uh, you know, in a company mm -hmm. for a living. And, uh, I'm, uh, in in consumer-facing businesses in particular, 50 million bucks goes a long way to catch up. It sounds like what you were saying earlier about the value proposition is really still what rules and maybe even above and yeah, ahead of first to market. I'm, so are, are there, the question is, are there metrics that you're examining during due diligence uh, to determine if, you know, during this growth stage, the early stage, it's, it's a viable, good investment? For me, this market space, like I said earlier, is so heterogeneous that no two businesses are alike. It's hard to generalize. Um, th that's an interesting spin on the question. I hadn't thought about it that way because a percent growth rate might be, you know, uh, universal, universally applicable. But most people ask the question: How many users do you get? Need do I need to get to uh, uh, to be interesting? And you know, that's it, it, it's uh, you know it's comparing an apple and an orange and a banana and a kumquat because. There's uh, no two businesses monetize traffic or registered users or subscribers or uh, visits or visitors in the same way. Uh, we don't have hard and fast rules. Uh, it's, it's really it's really about the you know, the gestalt, all the everything that, that goes into it, and everything you learn. Uh, I'm glad. So I Jim, wish I could give you more guidance. I'm glad Jim gave that answer because I was going to look pretty stupid saying I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. We've got time for a few more questions. Yes, in the back. Okay, so so the question on for the investors, for the, the VCs and the angels is, when you're talking to entrepreneurs, um, I guess on a, at an academic level, even what what do you wish they were they knew? And this is from the director of uh, entrepreneur programs at SBCC. And then for the invest for the entrepreneurs, what would you have done differently to maybe be more efficient with your side equity and your in, obviously investments and those of your friends and family? I suppose there are a lot of ways that I could answer that question, but um, you know, one thing that comes to mind is you would like to see people that can communicate ideas clearly, and I think for two reasons. First of all, it gives me some comfort that their thought process is working in a reasonable way, <laughs> but also if you cannot communicate ideas clearly, how are you going to sell? your product, your company, you know, to a VC, you know, to the outside world. And it's amazing to me. I mean, I used to do this all the time. I'd go to people and I'd ask them to write me a little paragraph and this garbage would come back. And I would go to them and I'd say, I don't understand a word of this. Tell me what you meant. And in perfect English, they would tell me what they meant. And I'd say, well, why didn't you write that? And I don't know what it is that communication skills are so difficult at some point, and I, I think that is teachable. Hopefully. Jim. Um, <laughs> I was just uh, discussing with a, with a friend earlier that my partner in my fund uh, blogs and uh, has a Wharton MBA, and uh, he has a recent entry that the stupidest thing an entrepreneur can do is waste two years getting an MBA. <laughs> um, you learn so much more by doing, spending yeah. those two years doing, and you know, even if you're failing, especially if you're failing, you learn so much more than you can apply in, in future exam uh, future situations. So, um, the thing I would love to see in uh, uh, stressed in entrepreneurship ex uh, uh, curricula is real world experience, and especially here in Santa Barbara. For our, for the size of this community, we have a thriving startup ecosystem. Uh, you know, make people go get internships. Uh, uh, make people go get two internships at a time so they can see different stuff. Hmm. Uh, with regard to subject matter, um, one of the things that I think is under-recognized, especially with technical founders, uh, is that uh, being in a startup, building something from nothing is all about convincing people to do something for you. It's illogical at the surface. Yeah, the, the, you know whether it's whether they're um, advisors, whether they're vendors, whether they're customers, whether they're potential employees. You know, it, so much of it is selling and negotiating. I think I think probably something that's overlooked is a, is a negotiations um, uh, competence. 
which goes hand in hand with the mm. Thank you. Yeah, so um, uh, I would say that uh, communication is underrated, uh, and specifically, you need to let them know it's hard. So when we first went out to raise money, um, you know, I'd been a marketing consultant in the internet day. I, I sort of knew the process and the exercise of taking the technology and figure out how to communicate about it to people who aren't technologists. But when it was my company, when it was my technology, it was so hard. We need so much surface contact with the marketplace to say something and see dead faces and try and figure it out. Um, it, was, it wasn't until after I gave up on, on that round that I sat down with uh, a person who's now one of my advisors and they said, I get your problem. It's a real problem. I just don't see how you solve it. And I'm like, oh my goodness, I've been out trying to raise money using this language. So it's, it's not that it's important but that it's hard and you need to keep working at it, constantly working at it. I think that's about the sales thing. You're constantly selling. I, I think that was underrated in my education. Mm -hmm. I, for me, I think, uh, if I'm understanding, what kind of thing might I do differently is uh, more of this kind of thing, frankly. I mean, the conversations I've had with these two guys today have been amazing and eye-opening. And I, I, it's... For whatever reason, I don't think I applied enough networking with other entrepreneurs who have interests that are very different than my own to help enlighten my process. And it's strange that I didn't do that for this because I've done it for so many other things in my life. So I would say um, that's uh, something that I'm going to be changing. <laughs> yeah. uh, so I'm a doctor. I'm not a technologist. I'm not a product developer. I, I saw a big problem in our healthcare delivery system, and I, and I had an idea. I worked with a lot of people to get to the point to launch the product, and it was, it was a lot of trial and error. There, there were partnerships that didn't work out, and I don't think I could change that. I think it was you have to find people you trust, and if you don't trust them, you need to find somebody else. But I, I don't think I could have changed anything uh, in, the, in the process of developing the product. So one more thing to add, actually. Um, I, I think the experience in startups is critical. I'm a huge believer that if you're working for a big company, all you're learning is how to work for a big company. So um, I actually, uh, it took me 13 years to get my bachelor's. That used to be my slideshow. Um, because, because I left twice to join startups. I actually started the Entrepreneur Club at Caltech and then dropped out to join a startup. So... I, <laughs> And that was great. I mean, that was fun. But the reality was, you know, sitting in uh, a garage or in my bedroom or with fellow students or people of that age, we were reinventing things from the ground up. I would have been much better off and probably much richer today if instead of it having to be my own idea, I had gone and worked at Netscape or AOL back in the day. Because I would have learned how they think about things, how they do things, how they keep the energy and focus and everything moving. Mm -hmm. um, and I think I would have leapfrogged. Um, you know, probably at least five years of my effort of out there on my own, trying to make it happen, trying to figure it out. So internships mm -hmm. in real startups. Yeah, that seems to be the theme, communication, uh, networking the right way, and, uh, you know, sometimes just failing, right? I mean, trial and error. Yes, question. What, what do you want to accomplish in the next 90 days uh, and maybe even through the rest of this year? Joe? <laughs> Okay, so um, we are going to be hopefully launching our product uh, to a public beta in June, um, and I'm also forming a new trade association for user-driven services. So um, that's coming out of the user-centric community and, and vendor relationship management, and uh, that's largely going to be the vehicle with which we introduce this whole idea of when you put the user in charge, you create a whole bunch more value because of the intention economy. And by the way, I, I'm living that with my company as an example. So. Okay. Uh, our, goal, our goal will be to launch a beta to begin to get feedback from consumers, work out the glitches, and move on to uh, the, having something having a real launch by the end of the year. Uh, well, with Chart Medica, it's uh, we're starting an aggressive marketing campaign, and the goal would be to increase the user base. Okay. Any other questions? Last chance. Okay. Well, I want to take a moment and thank uh, Dr. Geiler, Antonio, and uh, Joe, certainly Jim Adelman and John Isaacson for coming out tonight. They've been tremendous uh, value, and I hope uh, everybody enjoyed what we heard.
We do meet uh, monthly here, and we've got a couple of uh, upcoming sessions that you ought not to miss. March 18th, uh, bootstrapping your startup. So it sounds like maybe even uh, the stage before these three entrepreneurs, what, what it would take. And April 15th, the last customer standing. <laughs> doing, doing business with the U.S. government, which is uh, hopefully we'll still have money by April 15th. I'm kidding. Of course we will. We're doing great. Things are fine. Thank you very much for coming out. Thank you.